Hello everybody and welcome to another look at uh, some great war stuff for what's in the box. And in this one, we're gonna be checking out the Americans. And the Americans box is, let me get it right, Brett's Brawlers. And um, this is an interesting one because America didn't have a lot of um, indigenous designs for stuff. So what ended up happening was that a lot of their equipment and a lot of their vehicles in particular were given by other nations. So in example here on the table, we have three French tanks and I believe maybe even one of the French guns being used uh, as part of the American force. Even the Americans at the time still used a lot or did use a lot of equipment that was based off or given by the British. So their helmets and some of their uniform elements and stuff like that were all from other nations to get them up to speed and get them involved. So what we have here is quite a large force. It's on par with the, the French force that we, um, we had a look at before. We have two large uh, rifle companies. We have a machine gun platoon of four. We have mortars, uh, a mortar platoon of two. Uh, we have a couple of infantry guns, I believe the 37 millimeters in with the platoons. I'm not sure if that's how they are formed up or not. Shea built this one. Can blame him if it's wrong. We again have the command elements for each platoon, plus the company command and a sniper team down here as well. Overall, there's not a lot to talk about model wise. Um, it's mainly because a lot of these infantry models kind of look the same, you know, a rifle team's a rifle team, that sort of thing. It's more in the army makeup and I don't have uh, stack cards or rulebook I'm working from. So what we did was just build the box contents based off a list that was handed to us and said, this is close to what um, 100 points should be and um, just go from there. So because I'm the tank guy and you'll have noticed in the, the, the previous unboxings on the Great War, I like to talk about the tanks. So, um, yeah, let's just talk about the tanks. First up, we once again have a Saint-Chamond. It's the exact same layout and the exact same vehicle as the French army were using. I believe the Americans had a few of these. I don't know how well they did with them. Um, again, I think a lot of these nations eventually started to use uh, excess British stuff because the British were in a better position to manufacture enough tanks, even though they did take quite a while to build some of them. I mean, at Cambrai, you had hundreds of them. Uh, but they had to use what they were given. So they were given the Saint-Chamond. I really don't think they liked it that much, but I, I could be proven wrong there if someone wants to leave a comment uh, down below about that. So we've talked about the Saint-Chamond in the French uh, army unboxing, so we'll get that out of the way because the real important vehicle is these, the FT-17 built by Renault. These really are the granddaddy of at least most contemporary tank design mainly because it's got a fully revolving turret. Uh, it's got a cannon or a machine gun. I've put one of each on these two vehicles. So we have a cannon and a machine gun. These turrets aren't settled down, so whatever you want. Um, the layout is more contemporary vehicle as well. Engine in the back separated by a firewall from the crew compartment, where you have the commander who stood up, uh, stood up right underneath the turret and a driver who's sitting down uh, in the driver compartment right at the nose of the vehicle. So what makes the FT-17 important to the Americans? A, they got one, or they got a few of them. They seem to have a bit more success with these light tanks compared to the saint Chamon, And I think even in general, even comparing it to the British Mark IVs and all the other stuff that was running around at the time, this was probably the more successful design simply because it didn't need lots of crew, lots of guns. It was still able to cross trenches, okay, maybe not as broad as the, the Mark IVs were able to do, but it could still do off-roading pretty well. Had nice wide tracks, nice big flat tracks with plenty of surface area to keep that flotation for the vehicle over muddy ground. They seem to be very successful. And the main part of this, we're gonna take it out of World War I for a second here. Moving into the interwar period, the American army was forming its tank doctrine based on the amount of these that they had. They had a lot of these tanks after the, the First World War and were able to develop doctrine and it definitely drove design. Um, 
towards the, the start of World War II. What type of tanks do we want? Well, we've had success with these little light tanks, so why don't we develop doctrine and vehicles based on this light tank concept? And what they did was they made lots of little light tanks, particularly FTs, they actually um, home built a, a lot as well on the same design. I think they were licensed by Renault. And um, they just formed this whole bee swarm idea that the French had had where you had lots of light tanks that would just charge across, almost replacing the cavalry to an extent and breaking through lines with overwhelming numbers and overwhelming firepower. That doctrine was, ha was heavily carried into the interwar period and to the start of World War II, where we see the Americans' doctrine heavily surrounding the, the usage of light and medium armor that was able to move fast and carry a lot of machine guns. The cult of the machine gun, as many tank experts will tell you, was something that the Americans took very seriously, and as many machine guns on a tank as possible. But a lot of the, the decisions stemmed from the experience they had in the First World War with the Renault FT-17. And I think its, its performance was definitely one of the better tanks of the war and certainly expanded upon that into the Second World War as well. Apart from that, not much else to say, so let's come back and wrap up. With that little bit of tank gibberish out of the way, do feel free to go and check out the likes of The Chieftain on YouTube, where he talks about uh, World War I, interwar, and early World War II, particularly from an American perspective. He has a lot more in-depth videos on that. Definitely uh, go check that out uh, if you want a little bit of education on the subject. It is fascinating, especially some of the, um, the dead ends as well. There's a few dead ends out there that um, are very interesting because of their failures. However, that said, this looks like a pretty decent army. Let me know in the comments if you play Americans and how you would field a force like this and tell me what the sort of points values we're looking at here as well. Until then, thank you so much for watching. Take care, stay safe, and see you again very soon. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.